afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome to the National Press Club. My name is Monroe Carmen. I'm the Vice President of the Press Club and Editor-at-Large at Bloomberg Business News. I'd like to welcome club members and their guests in the audience today, as well as uh, those of you watching on C-SPAN or listening to the program on National Public Radio or the Global Internet Computer Network. Before introducing our head table, I would like to remind our members of upcoming speakers. On Tuesday, October 11th, Jane Alexander, Chair of the National Endowment of the Arts, will present a speech entitled, The American Community Connecting Through the Arts. On Wednesday, October 12th, Ralph Reed, Executive, uh, excuse me, Executive Director of the Christian Coalition, will talk about the emerging faith factor in American politics. And on Thursday, October 13th, Arthur Levitt, Chairman of the Securities and Exchange Commission, will talk about taking the message out of the marketplace, the SEC's consumer education campaign. Audio and, and videotapes of press club luncheons are available through the National Press Club Library or by calling 1-800-500-9926. If you have any questions for our speakers, please write them on the card, uh, cards provided at your table and pass them up to me. I will ask as many as time permits. I'd now like to introduce our head table guests and ask them to stand briefly when their names are called. From your right, Stephanie Overman of HR Magazine, Edward Kane of Knight Ritter Financial News, Greg Robb of AFX News, Robert Bruska, Chief Economist at Nico Securities, Stan Kroc of Business Week, Carolyn Lynch, the spouse of our speaker. All right, fine, go ahead. Benita Anand of Pension, uh, Pensions and Investments and member of the National Press Club who arranged today's luncheon. James Johnson, Chairman and CEO of Fannie Mae. Representative Edward Markey, Democrat from Massachusetts and Chairman of the House Subcommittee on Telecommunications and Finance. Lee Shepard of Tax Notes. David Weiss of the Washington Post. I'd also like to thank the staff members who organized today's lunch. Melissa Bender, Sherry Burton, Melanie Abdo-Dermott, and Jeff Tarbell. There's one thing you have to understand about our luncheon speaker today. Sometimes Peter Lynch may look, if he, look as if he's going out for a sandwich at lunch. But what he's really doing is trying to figure out if Aubin Penn is a good investment. <laughs> Lynch is always on the prowl for a good stock. One friend says that if you came to him with the best widget in the world and the Queen of England were sitting on one side of him and Cindy Crawford on the other, he would ignore them and inundate you with questions about the widget maker's management. His intense interest in anything that would produce a good return is one reason few people have had a greater impact on the investment world. In fact, the market dropped about 40 points one day when a compressed version of his market views went over an online computer service he had said that if you looked at markets over a 20-year period, there were ups and downs. But that got translated into the headline, 
Lynch predicts market correction. <laughs> but the Lynch legend is based more on what he has done than on what he has said. He helped transform investing by giving individuals <laughs> access to a mutual fund that steadily outperformed the market and competitors for more than a decade. His performance at Magellan earned the appreciation, pun intended, of many Americans who paid for their kids' college through Magellan's growth. When Mr. Lynch became portfolio manager for Magellan in 1977, it had less than 20 million in assets. By the time he retired in 1990 to spend more time with his family, Magellan was the largest mutual fund in the world with more than one million shareholders and approximately 14 billion in assets. It's easy to see what attracted shareholders to Magellan. The share price had risen 28-fold since Mr. Lynch had taken the helm, with annual increases averaging 29%. Even more remarkable, though big funds are supposed to have more difficulty than smaller funds in outper outperforming the market, in the last five years of Mr. Lynch's stewardship, Magellan outperformed 99% of all stock funds. Given it, his golden touch, <coughs> excuse me, it's no surprise that Mr. Lynch's books, one up on Wall Street and beating the street, I have one here, have been best sellers. His message is really rather simple, if he'd uh, allow me to paraphrase it. He thinks anyone can get rich in the stock market if they do two things. Use their powers of observation, and do their homework. Still, Mr. Lynch knows how to lose money, too. The Magellan Fund lost about $2 billion, maybe more, in a single day in 1987 when the stock market crashed. I personally uh, hosted Mr. Lynch uh, once before, a few years ago, and he was uh, discussing his views on uh, the stock market, and I asked him to give me some examples of stocks he liked at the time. He uh, suggested Asparo, the Italian fast food uh, chain, whose price uh, rose uh, remarkably over the past uh, few years. And he also recommended Texas Air, which dropped, crashed to nothing. So I think he would agree that he is not infallible, too. A native of Boston, uh, Mr. Lynch is a 1965 graduate of Boston College and received his MBA from the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School of Business Administration. He served as a lieutenant in the Army before coming to uh, uh, Fidelity in 1969. He currently serves as vice chairman of Fidelity, sits on the boards of Morris and Knudsen and W.R. Grace, and is heavily involved in charity work. Will you please welcome Mr. Peter Lynch. Uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I uh, love this town. And uh, it's a thrill to be here with uh, Jim Johnson, uh, who did so much for uh, Fannie Mae. And that was the greatest single stock of my life. And uh, it's still my largest position. And I. Anybody wants to talk after about how to make money, I'll tell them how to buy more Fannie Mae. And I've added Freddie Mac to the list, too. And Congressman Ed Markey, who was a, went to Boston College and also Boston College Law School and has done a great job in Congress for, uh, for everybody in this country, but especially the people in his districts in Massachusetts. But great honor is to have my wife, Carolyn, right here, my, uh, my sweetheart, my uh, great stock picker, who, uh, who uh, found legs and uh, a bunch of other good stocks. So. What I'm going to try and do today, uh, briefly, is, I don't know what I'm supposed to do with this gavel. I've never had one of these things before. But, uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, I'm going to try and uh, say some words on the things I've used over the years uh, when I was an uh, amateur, when I ran Magellan, I still use today. I think they make sense. I think they make a lot of sense for investors. And uh, 
I frankly think it's a, a tragedy in America that the small investor has been convinced by the media, the print media, the, the radio, the television media, that they don't have a chance. That they don't, the big institutions with all their computers and all their degrees and all their money have all the edges. And it just isn't true at all. And when they're convinced, when this happens, when this occurs, people act accordingly. They, when they believe it, they buy stocks for a week, and they buy options, and they buy the Chile fund this week, and next week it's the Argentina fund, and, and they get results proportioned to that kind of investing. And that's very bothersome. I think the public can do extremely well in the stock market on their own. I think the fact that institutions dominate the market today is a positive for small investors. These institutions push stocks on usual lows, they push them on usual highs. For someone that can sit back and have their own opinion, know something about the industry, this is a positive. <coughs> it's not a negative. So that's what I want to talk about. And the single, uh, single most important thing to me in the stock market for anyone is to know what you own. I'm amazed how many people own stocks. They, they would not be able to tell you why they own it. They couldn't say in a minute or less why they own it. Actually, if you really press them down, they'd say the reason I own this is the sucker's going up. I mean, that's the only reason. <laughs> that's the only reason they own it. And if you can't explain, I'm serious, you can't explain to a 10-year-old in two minutes or less why you own a stock, you shouldn't own it. And that's true, I think, about 80% of people that own stocks. And this is the kind of stock people like to own. This is the kind of company people adore owning. This is a relatively simple company. They make a, a very uh, narrow, easy to understand product. They make a one megabit SRAM, CMOS, bipolar risk, floating point, data IO, IO array processor, with an optimizing compiler, a 16 dual port memory, a double diffused metal oxide semiconductor monolithic logic chip with a plasma matrix vacuum fluorescent display. It has a 16-bit dual memory. It has a Unix operating system, four whetstone megaflop polysilicone emitter, a high bandwidth, that's very important, six gigahertz, <laughs> double metallization communication protocol, an asynchronous backward compatibility, peripheral bus architecture, four-wave interleave memory, a token ring interchange backplane, and it does it in 15 nanoseconds of capability. Now, if you own a piece of crap like that, <laughs> you will never make money. Never. Somebody will come along with more whetstones or less whetstones or a bigger mega flop or a smaller mega flop. You won't have the foggiest idea what's happened. And people buy this junk all the time. I made money in Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> I can understand it. I, uh, when there was recessions, I didn't have to worry about what was happening. I could go there, and people were still there. I didn't have to worry about low-priced Korean imports. I mean, I just didn't have, you know, I can understand it. And you laugh, I made 10 or 15 times my money in Dunkin' Donuts. Those are the kind of stocks I can understand. If you don't understand it, it doesn't work. This is the single biggest principle. And it bothers me that people are very careful of their money. The public, when they buy a refrigerator, they get a consumer report, so they buy a microwave oven, they do that. They ask people what's the best kind of radar range or, they, or what kind of car to buy. They do research on the apartments. When they, go to, when they go on a trip to Wyoming, they get the mobile travel guide or California. When they go to Europe, they get the Michelin travel guide. People will hear a tip on a bus on some stock and they'll put half their life savings <laughs> in it before sunset and they wonder why they lose money in the stock market. And when they lose money, they blame it on the institutions and program trading. That is garbage. They didn't do any research. They bought a piece of junk. They didn't look at the balance sheet. And that's what you get for it. And that's what we were being driven to. And it's self-fulfilling. The public does terrible investing, and they, they say they don't have a chance. It's because that's the, way they're, that's the way they're acting. I'm trying to convince people there is a method. There are reasons for stocks that go up. Uh, Coca-Cola, this is very magic. It's a very magic number. Easy to remember. Coca-Cola is earning 30 times per share what they did 32 years ago. The stock has gone up 30-fold. Bethlehem Steel is earning less than they did 30 years ago. The stock is half its price of 30 years ago. Stocks are not lottery tickets. There's a company behind every stock. If a company does well, the stock does well. It's not that complicated. People get too carried away. And first of all, they try and predict the stock market. That is a total waste of time. No one can predict the stock market. They try to predict interest rates. I mean, this is a, if anybody would predict interest rates right three times in a row, they'd be a billionaire. Considering there's not that many billionaires on the planet, 
it's very, you know, I took, I had logic, so I had a syllogism in the study of these when I was at Boston College. There can't be that many people who can predict interest rates because there'd be lots of billionaires. And no one can predict the economy. I had a lot of people in this room were around in 1981 and 82 when we had a 20% prime rate with double digit inflation, double digit, digit uh, unemployment. I don't remember anybody telling me in 1981 about it. I didn't read, I studied all this stuff. I don't remember anybody telling me we're going to have the worst recession since the Depression. So, what I'm trying to tell you, it'd be very useful to know what the stock market is going to do. It'd be terrific to know that the Dow Jones average year from now would be X, that we're going to have a full scale recession, or interest rates going to be 12%. That's useful stuff. You never know it, though. You just don't get to learn it. So, I've always said if you spend 14 minutes a year on economics, you've wasted 12 minutes. And I, I, I really believe that. Now, I have to be, I'd be fair, I'm talking about economics on the broad scale, predicting the downturn for next year or the upturn or M1 and M2, 3B and all these, all these M's. The, uh, I'm talking about economics to me is when you talk about scrap prices. When I own auto stocks, I want to know what's happening to used car prices. When used car prices are going up, it's a very good indicator. When I own hotel stocks, I want to know hotel occupancy stuff. When I own chemical stocks, I want to know what's happening to the price of ethylene. These are facts. If aluminum inventories go down five straight months, that's relevant. I can deal with that. Home affordability, I want to know about it. When I own uh, Fannie Mae or I own a housing stock. These are facts. You can, they're economic facts and it's economic predictions. And economic predictions are a total waste. And uh, interest rates, Alan Greenspan's a very honest guy. He would tell you that he can't predict interest rates. He could tell you what short rates are going to do in the next six months. Try and stick them on what the long-term rate will be three years from now. They'll say, I don't have any idea. So how are you, the investor, supposed to predict interest rates if the head of the Federal Reserve can't do it? So I think that's, uh, but you should study history, and history is the important thing you learn from. What you learn from history is the market goes down. It goes down a lot. The math is simple. There's been 93 years a century. This is easy to do. The market's had 50 declines of 10% or more. So 50 declines in 93 years. About once every two years, the market falls 10%. We call that a correction. That means, that's a euphemism for losing a lot of money rapidly. But we, you know, we call it a correction. And uh, uh, so 50 declines in 93 years, about once every two years, the market falls 10%. Of those 50 declines, 15 have been 25% or more. That's known as a bear market. We've had 15 declines in 93 years. So every six years, the market's going to have a 25% decline. That's all you need to know. You need to know the market's going to go down sometime. If you're not ready for that, you shouldn't own stocks. And it's good when it happens. If you like a stock at 14 and it goes to 6, that's great. You understand the company, you look at the balance sheet, and they're doing fine. And you're hoping to get to 22 with it. 14 to 22 is terrific. 6 to 22 is exceptional. So you take advantage of these declines. They're going to happen. No one knows when they're going to happen. It would be very, people tell you about it after the fact that they predicted it, but they predicted it 53 times. And uh, so you can take advantage of the volatility in the market if you understand what you own. Uh, so I think that's the key to element. Another key element is that you have plenty of time. People are in an unbelievable rush to buy a stock. I'll give you an example of a well-known company. Walmart went public in October of 1970. 1970 it went public. Already had a great record. It had 15 years performance, great balance sheet. You could have waited 10 years saying you're a very conservative investor, you're not sure this Walmart can make it. You want to check, you're, you're, you see them operate in small towns, you're afraid they can only make it in seven or eight states, you want to wait till they go to more states. You keep waiting. You could have bought Walmart 10 years after they went public and made 35 times your money. If you bought it when they went public, you would have made 500 times your money, but you could have waited 10 years after Walmart went public and made uh, 30, over 30 times your money. You could wait three years after Microsoft went public and made 10 times your money. Now, if you knew something about software, I know nothing about software. If you knew something about software, you would have said, these guys have it. I don't care who's going to win, Compaq, IBM. I don't know who's going to win Japanese computers. I know Microsoft, MS-DOS is the right thing. You could have bought Microsoft. Again, I'm repeating myself, stocks are not a lottery ticket. There's a company behind every stock. And you, you can just watch it. You have plenty of time. People are in an amazing rush to purchase a security. They're out of breath when they call up. You don't need to do this. It's, uh, the, uh, you need an edge to make money, too. People have incredible edges, and they throw them away. 
I'll give you a quick example of uh, Smith Klein. This is a stock in, that had Tagamet. Now, you didn't have to buy Smith Klein when Tagamet was doing clinical trials. You didn't have to buy Smith Klein when Tagamet was talked about in the New England Journal of Medicine or the British version, Lancet. You could have bought Smith Klein when Tagamet first came out, a year after it came out. Let's say your spouse, your mother, your father, you were a nurse, you're a druggist, you're writing all these prescriptions. Tagamet was doing an amazing job of curing ulcers, and it was a wonderful pill for the company because if you just stopped taking it, the ulcer came back. See, it, wasn't, it wouldn't have been a crummy product that you took it for a buck and it went away, but it was a great product for the company. But you could have bought it two years after the product was on the market and made five or six times your money. I mean, all the druggists, all the nurses, all the people, millions of people saw this product, and they're out buying oil companies, you know, or drilling rigs, you know. <laughs> it happens. And then you, three years later, or four years later, Glaxo, even a bigger company, it's a huge company, a British company, brought out Zantac, which was a better, at that time, an improved product. And you could have seen that take market share do well. You could have bought Glaxo and triple your money. So you only need a few stocks in your lifetime. They're in your industry. I think of people, if you'd worked in the auto industry, let's say you're an auto dealer the last 10 years, you would have seen Chrysler come up in the minivan. You've seen, if you're a Buick dealer, or a Toyota dealer, Honda dealer, you would have seen the Chrysler dealership packed with people. You could have made 10 times your money on Chrysler a year after the, the minivan came out. Ford introduces the Taurus Sable, the most successful line of cars in the last 20 years. Ford went up sevenfold on the Taurus Sable. So if you're a car dealer, you only need to buy a few stocks every decade. When your lifetime's over, you don't need a lot of five baggers to make a lot of money starting with $10,000 or $5,000. So in your own industry, you're gonna see a lot of stocks, and that's what bothers me. There are good stocks out there looking for you, and people just aren't listening, and they're just not watching it. And uh, they have incredible edges. People have big edges over me. <clears throat> they work in the aluminum industry. I see aluminum industries coming down, in inventories coming down six straight months. They see demand improving. In America today, you know, you know, it's hard to get an EPA permit for a bowling alley, never mind an aluminum smelter. So you know when aluminum gets tight, you just can't build seven aluminum smelters. So when, when you see this coming, you can say, wait a second, I can make some money. When an industry goes from terrible to mediocre, the stock goes north. When it goes from mediocre to good, the stock goes north. When it goes from good to terrific, the stock goes north. There's lots of ways to make money in your own industry. You can be a supplier in the industry, you can be a customer. This thing, this thing happens in the paper industry, it happens in the steel industry. It doesn't happen every week, but if you're in you're some field, you'll see a turn, you'll see something in the publishing industry. These things come along, and it, it's just mind-boggling, people throw it away. Uh, one, one of the things I find a rule, I, 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 a couple of rules I want to throw out <coughs> that I find useful, <coughs> excuse me, is a lot of times people buy on the basis, the stock has gone down this much, how, you know, how much further can it go down? I remember when Polaroid went from 130 to 100, people said, here's this great company, great record. If it ever gets below 100, you know, just buy every share, you know, and it did get below 100. A lot of people bought on that basis saying, look, it's gone from 135 to 100. It's not 95, what a buy. Within a year, it was 18. And this is a company with no debt. I mean, this is a company, it was just so overpriced, it went down. Uh, I did the same thing in my, uh, I think my first or second year of Fidelity. Kaiser Industries had gone from $26 this year to 16. I said, how much lower can it go? It's 16. So I think we bought one of the biggest blocks ever on the, New York, on the American Stock Exchange of Kaiser Industries at 14. I said, you know, it's gone from 26 to 16. How much lower can it go? Well, at 10, I called my mother and said, Mom, you got to uh, look at this Kaiser Industries. I mean, how much lower can it go? It's gone from 26 to 10. <laughs> well, it went to 6, it went to 5, it went to 4, it went to 3. And... Uh, now, I under, fortunately, this happened rapidly, or I would probably be still caddying or uh, being, you know, working at the stop and shop, but I, it happened fast, so I was able to, this, this was compressed. It, uh, and at three, I figured out, you know, there's something very wrong here, because Kaiser Industries owns 40% of Kaiser Steel, they own 40% of Kaiser Aluminum, they own 32% of Kaiser Cement, they own Kaiser Broadcasting, they own Kaiser Sand and Gravel, Kaiser Engineers, they own Jeep, they own business after business, and they had no debt. Now, I learned this very early. This is, might be a breakthrough for some people. It's very hard to go bankrupt if you don't have any debt. It's, it's tricky. Some people can approach that. It's a, real, it's a real achievement. But they had no debt, and the whole company at three was selling at about $75 million. At that point, it was equal to buying one Boeing 747. I said, there's something wrong. 
with this company selling for 75 million. I was a little premature at 16, but uh, I said everything's fine, and eventually this will work out. And they, what they did is they gave away all their shares to their shareholders. They, they passed out shares in Kaiser's Men, they passed out shares in Kaiser Aluminum, they passed out their public shares in Kaiser Steel, they sold all the other businesses, and you get about $50 a share. And, but if you didn't understand the company, if you're just buying on the fact the stock had gone from 26 to 16, and then it got to 10, what would you do when it went to 9? What would you do when it went to 8? What would you do when it went to 7? This is the problem that people have, is they sell stocks because they didn't know why they bought it, then it went down, and they don't know what to do now. Do you flip a coin? Do you walk around the block? You know, <laughs> what do you do? It's psychiatry that haven't worked so far. I've never seen them running in. The, the, the psychological psychiatry fund I've never seen listed for the, uh, for the SEC to make it through as a mutual fund. So I, they haven't seemed to help. Uh, I've tried prayer. That hasn't worked. The, uh, the, uh, so if you don't understand the company, you have this problem when they go down. Uh, eventually, they always come back. Uh, this one is... Uh, this one doesn't work either. Uh, people think uh, RCA just about got back to its 1929 high when General Electric took it over. Uh, a lot of double knits never came back. Remember those beauties? Uh, uh, floppy disks, Western Union. Uh, the list goes on and on. Uh, people saying it'll come back. Well, it doesn't have to come back. Uh, here's another one you hear all the time. It's $3. How much can I lose? I've had people call me up saying, I'm thinking of buying this stock at 3 How much can I lose? Well, again, you, you may need a piece of paper for this, but if you put, uh, you, you put $20,000 in a stock at 50, or your neighbor put $20,000 at, at 50 into the stock, and you put $20,000 in at three, and it goes to zero, you lose exactly the same amount of money, everything. And people say, it's three, how much can I lose? Well, if you put a million dollars on it, you can lose a million dollars. Just the fact that stock, this is the only, this may be a reason to research a stock. The fact that stock is three down from 100, doesn't mean you should uh, buy it. And in fact, short sellers, people that really make money in stocks, they don't short Walmart, they don't short Home Depot, they don't short the great companies, Johnson Johnson. They short stocks down from 80 to 7. They'd like to short it at 16 or 22, but they, f they figured out at 7 that this company is going to go to zero. They just haven't blown taps on this thing yet. It's going to zero. And they're, they're selling short at 7, they're selling short at 6, at 5, at 4, at 3, at 2, at 1 and a quarter. And you know what, to sell something short, you need a buyer. Somebody has to buy the damn thing. And you want to, who's buying this thing? It's these people saying, it's three. How much lower can it go? You know, the, uh, the, uh, now, here's a subject that you probably uh, all talked about. Getting close. Getting close, all right. We'll drop that one out. The, uh, the, it's getting very close, so it, uh, everybody has to go somewhere. So uh, the important thing is you can't get too attached to a stock. You have to understand there's a company behind it. You can't treat this like your grandchildren. You, know, you have to deal with the stock and say, I understand the company, and if they, it deteriorates, if the fundamentals slip, you have to say goodbye to it. You ha if one rule you want to remember is, the stock does not know you own it. This is, this is a breakthrough. So don't get, you know, you have to understand it and say, they're doing well, and as long as they keep doing well, my best stocks have been my fifth, sixth, seventh year I own them, not my fifth, sixth, seventh day. So you have to understand that and uh, stay with it. And then uh, I'll switch through to my, uh, my long shots. Avoid long shots. I bought about 30 long shots in my life. I've never broken even on one. Uh, the ones that are really bad are what we call whisper stocks. And uh, if Arthur Levitt was here, he'd, he'd, he'd appreciate these stories. But these are the times that somebody calls you up and say, hi, Peter, how's Carol, how are the kids? And I'd like to talk to you about uh, International Blivet. And, uh, and in, uh, what they have in this company is they have very good uh, earnings. Uh, earnings are going to be very, uh, they're going to be big, small. It's three dollars, uh, one dollar share. And they keep whispering, and they say, what are you talking about? I don't understand it. And <coughs> these are, now either they're so surrounded by people they're going to run out and buy this stock because it's so exciting, or they think the SEC is listening in, they'll get a shorter term. You know, they'll get, six months in the, in the camp rather than two years in the camp. For, but whisper stocks don't work. Uh, the, uh, and then I want to conclude with, uh, there's always something to worry about. Uh, if you own stocks, there's always something to worry about. You can't get away from it. Uh, what happens in the 50s, people were worried about, um, the, the only reason we got out of the depression was World War II. We got another recession. In the early 50s, they said, we're going to go right back into a depression. People worried about a depression in the 50s, and they worried about nuclear war. 
I mean, back then, uh, you know, the, the little warheads they had then, they couldn't blow up McLean, West Virginia, or McLean, Virginia, you know, or, or Charlestown. Now, all these countries that end in Stan, there's nine of these Stan countries that have come out of Russia, they all have enough warheads to blow the world up, and no one worries about it. When I was a kid, people were building fallout shelters, and we used to have this, this civil defense drill. Remember this one in high school? I mean, you'd get under your desk. I never thought even then that was a particularly good thing to do. <laughs> this, you know, they'd blow us, some people in a hat would all get under our desk, you know. At, uh... But in the 50s, people wouldn't buy stocks, except for the 80s. The 50s was the best decade, the century of the stock market. And people wouldn't buy stocks in the 50s because they're worried about nuclear war and they're worried about depression. Then people, <coughs> remember when oil went from 4 to 40 and, and it was going to go to 100 and we're going to have a depression? Remember that one? Well, about three years later, the same experts, now higher paid, oil's now at 10, and they said it was going to go to 4 and we're going to have a depression. And then the Japanese, remember how the Japanese were going to own the world? Remember that one? And that we're going to have a depression? And then about two years later, we're all worried about Japan collapsing. And this is the most absurd thing I've ever heard. It's a company with a 20% savings rate, incredible workforce, incredible productivity, and people are saying we're going to have a depression because Japan's going to collapse. And they had, you know, on their prayer list, they load Mother Teresa and crippled children, and they were praying for Japan at night. You know, you know, you know it's unbelievable. I mean, it, the, the LDC debt. Remember the LDC debt? Remember that one? All these countries, all Chase had lent their net worth to Brazil, Chile, Peru, and all these other countries, and so on, and all the other countries. And LD said they were not going to pay it back, and we're going to have a depression. It always ends, and we're going to have a depression. Or the Great Depression. We're going to have the Great Depression. I never could quite understand that adjective in front of depression, but the, uh, the Great Depression, or the big one, the big one's coming. But all these countries, and now I understand, you know, these are called the, then they were called less developed countries. Now, we used to call them underdeveloped countries. Those are all wrong terms. Those are not politically correct. You have to call these emerging countries. You can't use less developed or underdeveloped. Because it's, in fact, the other day I heard the, politically correct term for something that's overweight is laterally challenged. That's the, uh, the uh, that's a, and so there's always something to worry about and the key organ in your body in the stock market is your stomach. It's not the brain. If you can add 8 and 8 and get reasonably close to 16, that's the only level of math you need to know. You don't know to need the area under the curve. Remember that quadratic equation and a, an integral calculus and the area under the curve. I mean, whoever cared what was under the damn curve. I mean, you know, <laughs> but you had to study this. You don't need this in the stock market. So all you have to know is you're going to see it. It's always going to be scary. There's going to be always something to worry about. And you just have to forget all about it. Cut it all out and own good companies or own turnarounds. Study them and you'll do well. And that's all there is. And I've, I'm ready for questions. Okay. Thank you very much. When managing a portfolio, do you pay much attention to the activities of Congress and, and the regulators? Did Ed Markey put this one up? I'm not sure. Uh, I spend zero time uh, thinking about what's happening down here in Washington. And I uh, spend little time thinking what's going on in Russia or China. I just deal with facts. When the economy's going down, when, when the economy's going the wrong way, I can deal with that. This whole health uh, care reform bill drove a lot of drug stocks down to low levels. And I could say to myself, well, 60% of Johnson Johnson's earnings are outside the United States. Their pharmaceutical drug business is all in patent. Nothing's coming off patent. They only have 5% of sales from one product, which is Tylenol, which is already an over-the-counter drug and it's growing overseas. I says, why is this stock gone from 58 to 36? And these, co and these companies are already dealing in Japan and overseas with, with uh, they already have uh, the government controlling pharmaceutical prices. They've dealt with it. So I deal with facts. They might, this year, I thought it was very likely you'd have a bill passed on health care. It didn't happen. They drove the stocks down. But I think the stocks would have rebounded anyway, even if the health care bill was passed. So I don't deal with what's happening in Congress or what's going to happen in the future. I just deal with what's happening in the economy and what's happening to companies I call. Thank you. Uh, how useful is the financial reporting in the general daily press to you, and how useful should it be to investors in general? Okay. Uh, it has improved dramatically, uh, not just in the press, but also company reporting. Ten years ago, companies didn't have interim balance sheets. It's hard to imagine. They only gave their balance sheet to you once a year. Now they show you quarterly what's happened in their inventories, what's happened in receivables. 
and uh, in, in now in, uh, in, the, in the major newspapers, they'll even show types of funds. They're now, I think there's 2,500 companies in the New York Stock Exchange. There's over 5,000 different mutual funds. So there's twice as many mutual funds as there are stocks. At least in the paper day, it explains what kind of fund this fund is. So I think reporting has improved, the report earnings. But again, I think if you own auto stocks, you shouldn't be reading the financial part of the newspaper. On Wednesday, the, the local newspaper, Tuesday, some places, or on Saturday, they have a whole four pages on automobiles. And they talk about new models. And they say, this one stinks, and this one's outstanding. They really, if you own auto stocks, that's the part of the newspaper you should be in. You shouldn't be calling your broker four times a day to get stock quotes. It doesn't work. Getting up in the morning to look to see how you stocked it yesterday is not useful. It's, all this stuff is just a waste of time. If you're adding up how much your stocks are worth, absolute waste of time. If you should be looking at the company when you get the quarterly reports. You should be, if you're at the mall, imagine if you were in the, re, if you're in the retailing industry or if you're in the restaurant industry, you would have seen Taco Bell, you would have seen McDonald's, you would have seen Toys R Us. I mean, you would have seen all these companies do terrifically well. You would have seen Bombay, you would have seen Tandy with Radio Shack. And you would have seen Radio Shack roll across the country, and pretty soon there were you know, 25 Radio Shacks in every major city, and you said, there's not much room for them to go. But they had a 20-year great run. You, that's what you're dealing with. You're not dealing with the minutiae of today. You're dealing, what's this company doing two years, three years, four years, five years from now? And if you're dealing with a cyclical and business is turning around, you wait for signs that business is slowing down. And when you see it, you move on to something else. Are you concerned about the volatility in the uh, financial markets today? Do you think something needs to be done okay. to reduce it? I, I, I love volatility. I, I think I remember when uh, in 1972 the market went from uh, uh, down dramatically and Taco Bell went from 14 to 1. They had no debt. They never had a, a restaurant close. And, uh, I started buying at seven, but I kept on to it, and it went to one. And uh, it was the largest position in Magellan in 1978, when it was bought out for, by $42 by Pepsi-Cola. And I think it would have gone to 400 if they didn't buy it out. I think volatility is terrific. I think it is very, I think these callers are very important. I don't think the market going up 80 points one day and down 80 the next uh, is a good thing for the public. I think that's not a very good thing. But I think all of these callers and all these other things, to keep the volatility down each day is important. But the market's going to go up and down. Well, the, human nature hasn't changed a lot in 25,000 years. And some event will come out of left field, and uh, the market will go down, or the market will go up. So I, volatility will occur, and markets will continue to have these ups and downs. I think that's a great opportunity if people can understand what they own. If they don't understand what they own, they can own mutual funds, try and figure out mutual funds they own, and keep adding to it. Over, basically, corporate profits have grown about 8% a year, historically. So corporate profits double about every nine years. The stock market ought to double about every nine years. So I think the next market's about 3,800 today, 3,700. I'm pretty convinced the next 3,800 points will be up. It won't be down. The next 500 points, the next 600 points, I don't know which way they're going. So the market ought to double in the next eight or nine years. It ought to double again in the eight or nine years after that. Because profits will go up 8% a year, and, and stocks will fall. That's all there is to it. We're in the month of October. Beware of the month of October, the witching month for the stock market. What do you see uh, as the uh, outlook for this month? And when do you think the Dow will hit 4,000? Okay. The uh, October has always been a special month. Uh, I remember in 1987, I was very, uh, you know, I was very convinced that the market was, in no, it was not, not in trouble and I didn't worry about things. And, Carol and I had planned this great uh, golf vacation to Ireland, and we are going to visit one course and set a little house and visit another, go all along the west coast of Ireland and play golf. And we left on a Thursday night, and uh, the market went down 55 points that day, which was not too good. And uh, <laughs> the next day we got to Ireland, because of the time difference, we'd completed our day, and I got back to the hotel and I called in. The market had gone down 112 on Friday. And I said to Carol, and, uh, you know, I think if the, if the market goes down on Monday, uh, you know, we're going to have to go back, and, uh, and so we might as well, we stayed there for the weekend, and, uh, and on Monday the market went down 508 points, and my fund went from, uh, I think, 12 billion to 8 billion, and uh, that gets your attention, you know, in a <laughs> two, two working days, you know, I said, at the end of this week I'd be, uh, have no fund. Now, there wasn't a lot I could do, I mean, here I was, 
on Monday because the market uh, didn't open. You know, by 12 o'clock it was in Ireland. It was still uh, seven o'clock in New York. So we did spend that day and we uh, we did we played around golf in the morning. And then we went somewhere and sort of watched the market uh, deteriorate. And uh, <laughs> and uh, I did come back. There wasn't nothing I could do. I mean, just uh, the, the, nothing I could do about it. it uh, but I think my shareholders they called up and they said, "Well, what's Lynch doing?" They said, "Well." He's on the sixth hole, and he's, uh, you know, he's even par up to now, but he's in a trap. This could be, you know, this could be a triple bogey here. This could be a, could be a big inning. And uh, I, don't th I don't think that's exactly what they want to hear. That I can, they, so I could do something about this damn thing. So I came back home and uh, suffered with everybody else. And, and uh, fortunately, uh, I was very consistent. Uh, my, uh, the market went down. When I ran Magellan on 13 years, the market went down nine times. And every time the market went down, Magellan went down. I was nine for nine. And, uh, you know, because it's, it's, very, it's very important. There's another one of these numbers you ought to write down. If you put $1,000 in a stock, all you can lose is 1000 I've done that several times. And, uh, but if you're right, you can make 5000 10000 20000 So this business, you don't have to be right one out of two times. You can be right one out of four. It's a long time. The times you're right, you know the company's doing well, you know they're doing a great job, and you add to it, or at least you don't sell it, which is a terrible tragedy. So... You can make more money on the upside, so I just, I just wrote those out, and I will now flip a coin to tell you where the market will go to 4,000, this year or next year. Uh, heads means it goes up, it's a two-headed coin. Uh, the market will go up in the next year. That's, it. That's all I ever know about the stock market. Well, we have, uh, as you can imagine, many questions about uh, where people should put their money. I'm going to divide it into two parts, and if, uh, you can address it. Uh, this questioner intends to put $1,000 yearly into my four-year-old daughter's education fund. Where should I put it? Invest it one. Okay. The other just covers everybody else. What are, your, what are some of your current mar market favorites and why? Well, on, on the first one, and this is, this is important whether you're investing for a four-year-old, a 14-year-old, or a 74-year-old. You have to say, what am I going to do when the market goes down? Because I've had audiences like this, larger audiences, and I'll say, how many people in the room are short-term investors? I've never had anybody ever raise their hand. I mean, everybody in the world is a long-term investor until the market goes down. And like in 90, I remember 1990. 1990 was so much scarier than 87. 87, the market just <coughs> fell down. And you call up companies and said, our business is terrific. We're about to announce a stock, stock buyback. We're already buying back our stock. Business is great. And, we can't figure this out. But in 1990, you had Kuwait invaded. You had uh, the banking system really on the ropes. I mean, really close. You called up a company and said the business was slowing down. We sent 500,000 troops to Saudi. And uh, we were about to fight what people thought was the, uh, remember this, was the, it was the fourth largest army in the world. And they were the toughest army in the world. And we were, this was going to be a terrible war. And that we ought to sit them out. Remember the theory? We, Big theory, there's a lot of people in this city saying, we had to wait them out. You know, we'd still be waiting there at 120 degrees <laughs> with our 500,000 people. I mean, I think Bush made an incredibly uh, brave decision with, on the information he was getting to go in there and uh, knock them out, or we'd still be there. But that was an ugly time, and uh, that was very scary. And the public stood, lot, some people learned from 87, and they stood throughout that and said, I'm confident about the next 5, 10, 15 years of this country, and they hung in there. So I would say if you want to buy a small growth fund or you want to buy a balanced fund that's part bonds or part stocks, you put so much money in, put more in every year, you'll be very pleased in 10, 20, 30 years. Stocks will beat the hell out of money markets. They can beat the hell out of bonds. No group of, you think of it, any corporations, McDonald's, any of these great companies, Marriott, you name it, they've never got together and said, Geez, you know, we're really doing well. Why don't we raise the coupon in our bonds? You know, those, those bondholders have been really loyal. You know, you know, we, you know we've been given 8%. Why don't we raise it to 9 You know, uh, But companies like Automatic Data Processing, they do payroll. It's an amazing prosaic company. 32 years of higher earnings. 32 years of double-digit earnings growth. We've had recessions. We've had wars. We've had changes in Congress, changes in the Supreme Court. 32 years about burning. So, I mean, that's what you're relying on. Johnson Johnson, 30 years about burning. I mean, these are general parts, 42 years about burning. Emerson Electric, 38 years about burning. You don't see companies like this in other parts of the world. So I think uh, that's what you buy when you buy a fund. You're buying a bunch of good companies. 
And the second question was what again? Uh, just your uh, um, expense, oh, the stocks. Stocks. I, <coughs> well, I think I think the financial area has been uh, hurt heavily in the uh, stock market. I think that's an attractive area. Uh, stocks like Chemical or Travelers or Citicorp or Bank of Boston or Fleet or Shamit, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac. These stocks have all come down. Their business is terrific. They've improved their balance sheets. They're selling at multiples half or, or one third lower than the general market. I think the cyclicals. I think we have a chance for the cyclicals for the first time in a long time. The uh, the steels, the papers, the aluminums, the chemicals. I mean, they're, it's their turn to come to the plate, and uh, I think there's going to be a good time. The next, uh, we seem to have an economy recovering in uh, Latin America. Brazil is turning around. These are facts again. When you hear these facts, these countries are really. India, I've been visited India. Things are really improving in India. Europe had the worst recession since the. Depression, there's 18 million people out of work, 18 million people out of work in Western Europe right now. And the economy's starting to slowly turn. Japan is bottom. So I think you're going to see a demand. And commodity prices have been, aluminum prices got to 30 year low. Now they've, ingot has almost doubled. Uh, you're going to see the same thing with liner board. So you're going to see a very good uh, time for cyclical stocks. And I think the auto stocks are also extremely cheap at four or five times earnings. I think, I think the economy's going to be. My opinion, from the companies I talk to, and the business I look at, things are not off uh, trend line. These are not extraordinary times. Housing is very affordable. It's not as affordable as it was two years ago, but on a 20-year basis, housing is very affordable. Automobiles are very affordable. Uh, consumer durables are very affordable. I think people are going to, uh, and, and we, we've added, as you know, I, I still don't understand when people, we hear the job growth, we've added, uh, in the recession, we lost 1.8 million jobs. And now we've added back uh, 5.8 million, 4.5 million in the last uh, 19 months. So we lost 1.8, and we've added 5.8 back. We're 4 million to the good. The tough part of it is we dropped about 600,000 manufacturing jobs, and we've only brought back 100,000 manufacturing jobs. But there are a lot more people working, and I, I think that trend's going to continue. And in the decade of the 80s, I think this is key. The decade of the 80s, the only, this is what you hear from the press. This is what you hear from TV. In the decade of the 80s, the 500 largest companies eliminated 3 million jobs. 3 million jobs. But there was 2.1 million businesses started in the 1980s. And if they just have 10 people each, that's 21 million jobs. It's an incredible job machine we have in America. So that's what happened in the 80s. These 2.1 million businesses created all the jobs. And the decade of the 90s, the top 500 companies are going to eliminate another 3 million people. And all you ever hear about is, Company X lays off 5,000 people in Hartford, and Company Y lays off 5,000 people in Rochester, and somebody doesn't buy a sofa in Scottsdale, Arizona, because they're reading their newspaper about another layoff in the Northeast. I mean, that's the nature. These companies have to do it to stay, stay competitive. That's our business. And we've had, in the last two and a half years, been a phenomenal, uh, this has been a great thing for our country, we've had 1,750 companies come public. They've raised over $100 billion. There's only 2,500 companies in your side chain. 1,750 companies is a lot. They're going to put this into research and development. They're going to put it into, into more plant, more efficient equipment. This is a fantastic thing for these companies. So I, I think the situation is excellent. The banking system, for the first time since the early 50s, a lot of people follow the banking industry. The banking system today has more investments on the left side of the balance sheet. You talk about the, the governments they own, the mortgage-backed securities they own, than they have loans. First time ever since 1951. And they're only making 50, 20, 30 basis points. They'd love to make loans. The banking system has the highest equity to assets in 45 years. The banking system is ready to go. There's lots of liquidity around. I don't know why so people are so depressed about people getting hired all the time. I can't quite figure this out. I, that, I don't know. I have never met a banker, uh, anybody in, in business that likes recessions. I've yet to find these people. You know. So I think, I think it's very good the economy is doing well. Well, speaking of banks, are you concerned about uh, banks being uh uh, allowed to offer mutual funds and the confusion that creates among uh, investors over whether uh, uh, bank deposits are insured or not insured or how much is insured or the okay. whole question of deregulation. Okay. No, I think it's, I think it's very positive banks are be allowed to sell mutual funds because they'll probably sell a lot of Fidelity mutual funds. That's, uh, <laughs> that's uh, very important. No, but uh, seriously, I think it's very important that people understand when they own a bond fund, 
that bonds can go up and down. Bonds are just about as volatile as stocks. And if they own a 30-year bond fund, that you can lose 25, 30% of your money very fast, even though they're government bonds. Uh, people have to understand this. There's an incredible rate of illiteracy in, in, in our public, and all they ever hear about is what happened today to Bristol-Myers going up 2 or $3, what happened to Dow Jones. They don't get to learn anything about America. And people, at some point in their career, are presented, they're near retirement, they're given $450,000, $500,000, because it's an early retirement. They have no experience. They don't know what a bond is. They don't know what stocks are. And they have to make a decision in 30 or 60 days where they have a big tax consequence. These people have had no experience learning about the stock market. It's a tragedy. So I think anything we can do to educate the public, if you can convince people, if they understand the volatility of the stock market, I'm not saying anybody should buy a stock. I'm just saying if you buy, a, if you purchase a stock, you ought to do certain things. If you purchase a stock and do certain things, you will do better. If you're not ready to do those things, you, you should keep your money in the bank. Keep your money in a money market fund. Some people aren't willing to do the homework. They don't have the stomach for it. They should stay out. They're not doing anybody any good by taking half their life savings and putting in the stock market. Or they, they've, they've been lucky enough to save $50,000 or $60,000 to send their kids to college, and one's going to start in a year, and they're going to take all that money and put it in an equity mutual fund with a one-year horizon, that's doing no one any good. So I think the more, whether it's the banks that explain it, the brokers that explain it, anybody that does, and we're working on this at the SEC, the SEC is working very hard on this to explain to people the nature of these products. If they understand them, they'll do better with it. More information, the mayor of Fidelity is launching a major study, uh, will be out the end of this year on retirement. We've interviewed over 1,600 people, over 300 experts. We're gonna put a major study on, trying to explain to people about nature of retirement and how they can best understand how they should invest their assets. We're not going to mention Fidelity at all, of course. It may be subliminal in it, but, uh, <laughs> but we're trying to help. And it, uh, the more we can do this, and, I, and there's been an incredible push by the SEC to do this, and I think it's a very positive element. A couple of questions about that. Uh, <coughs> what do you think of the SEC's proposal to require mutual funds to adopt a quantitative rating scale for uh, riskiness, number one? And what effect uh, do you feel that the new uh, uh, shareholder rights proposals for more open disclosure and communication are having on companies and the markets? Okay. Uh, on the second one, I'm not too familiar with the first one. On the second one, I think you have to be careful with, in crossing the bridge on, on how much we get involved in managing companies. Uh, I think you, there should be disclosure of what people are getting paid. They should be disclosure how many shares they own. But I don't think we should be deciding whether they should make this acquisition or whether they should expand this plant. When you get too involved in running a company, it's very complex. And a lot of great companies have made a lot of decisions you haven't heard about because they decided not to do something. Some of the best decisions they didn't do was to not do something. And if they're under all this pressure from shareholders uh, of what to do and what not to do, they're going to take their eye off the ball and they're not going to be able to run the business. And, Companies are doing well because they look, the companies do well, look out five, six, seven years, and some of the decisions they make may not be the right thing for the next year. The more and more we concentrate on what they're doing and we keep commenting on as outsiders, it's going to be run by an enormous committee and we'll get committee results. So I don't think that's going to help anybody. But disclosure of relevant facts of how many options people have or the options at the market, what they're, what they're being paid, I think that's important, how many shares they own, what the company's doing. I think this. They used to not have a letter. I mean, it's, it's not that recently that you have comments by the chief executive at the, at the stop and end report. They never used to have to make that. There's a letter saying what happened. I mean, it really is a very valuable piece of information. You don't realize this company spent a lot of time on this. It's a very serious document. I think it's very helpful to shareholders. The, sh the quarterly shareholder reports are excellent. And also, I've stressed, you, everybody in America can get a hold of a company. It's not Fidelity and Putnam and Dreyfus. You can get a hold of a company if you own 100 shares. You can, you can call a company, somebody will talk to you about it. That people don't take advantage of that. These companies are willing to talk. On this quantitative and qualitative risk ratings, I think if it could be done, I think it might be positive. I'm a little confused on it. I, I'm not that up to date on it. But I think people should understand you know, that certain stock funds, emerging growth funds that invest in companies that have 50 million or sales, and very small and much more volatile than when you're buying major quality blue, blue chip growth companies and that long-term bonds are more valuable than medium-term bonds, which are more volatile than one-year bonds. I think these are things that should be explained to people. 
People should get a menu like they, you get at Howard Johnson's. Well, before we run out of time, and for Mr. Johnson's benefit, several uh, uh, people in the audience ask, how do you view Fannie Mae's stock and options today? Uh, well, I, I think uh, I'd broaden it to Freddie Mac, too. I think both of these companies, you know, have a great business. And, and it, it, I always look at, at uh, the stock market, uh, I, I think of it more, if people study chess, this would be not a good game to study for the stock market. Because in chess, an outstanding player will beat a good player 1,000 times in a row. It's all, everything's in front of you, all the moves are known, it's all technique. In poker or in bridge, there's a lot of uncertainties, there's a, lo a lot of things you don't know. You can play a hand exactly right and lose. You say, but I played it right. If I do it again over a night, over a month, I'll do it. That's the stock market. The stock market is much closer to poker than it is to uh, than any other game. And uh, I think that's what's, in, what's in the important thing to know. And what the hell was the question? No, oh, the, uh, <laughs> uh, Fannie, Mae. Uh, Fannie Mae has been sort of like a 27-card stud poker game. You know, over 20. <laughs> Cards keep getting turned over like uh, we're not doing so well in Houston. And uh, this is... 10 or 12 years ago, and, and with these 5% downs that, that, that a lot of people had in mortgages, and, and people moved there for jobs, and the job, they brought their spouse along, there, and the job left, they had no ties to those communities, and they, they left, or in Oklahoma, or in Alaska. So when that card turned over, it was kind of ugly. And then uh, they were losing a million dollars a day, that was easy to remember. Uh, that wasn't too pleasant. Uh, and what they uh, finally figured out was, we have a very good business, we're extremely low cost, and if we can match our uh, liabilities and our assets, make a very small spread, but we have very low costs, we can have a pretty good business. And then, then a card would come over like real estate prices started to go down in California. They started to go down in the Northeast. So then you had to say, well, I better keep checking to see what foreclosures would be like. And uh, you, you must own, that doesn't own anything, maybe. But so anyway, all, so all these things, if you keep watching the story, every year you get a chance to buy this again. Because something will come up, People were worried that rates were going to go down. So the stock went down because rates are going down. And then, and then now interest rates gone up. The stock's going down because interest rates gone up. And Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae are still doing great. And I think they're going to be terrific stocks. I mean, they're not going to, they're not going to quadruple, but I think they're about 25% undervalued now. And they'll be good stocks to own for five years. <coughs> it's my pleasure, Mr. Lynch, to present you with a press club mug and a certificate of appreciation before I ask the final question. Uh -oh. Here's a fella has a problem. He says, well, if the real secret of your success is following your daughters to the shopping mall for, shop, for stock tips, what do we bachelors do? Well, I, I, think, I think on the weekend, I think one of the reasons people uh, get so depressed is they get away from children. On the weekend, they read all these magazines, they read the newspapers, and they can become economists, and they get so depressed. I mean, they're, they're bullish if they take their lunch to work on Monday, you know. And I think, I think you need to rent a 12-year-old on the weekend just to, uh, because they don't know about the problem of the ozone layer disappearing and all the problems of, you know, all these terrible things that we think about all the time you get so depressed about and how second basemen and shortstops that are getting paid $4 million and they can't throw it to first base on a bounce, you know. Uh, you know, so I think you need to find a 12-year-old and rent him for the weekend and follow the this boy or girl around and see where they're shopping and our kids uh, love body shop you know and I bought it and uh, I think it's gonna be a good stock and my our oldest daughter Mary uh, liked Ann Taylor and she, she had a she had a dress up to go to work at a she was working a summer at a consulting firm and she thought Ann Taylor's uh, prices were good and the quality was good and and uh, it was a good it was a great stock tick and my wife Carolyn who is uh, until we had these three kids, she's, a, she's an extremely good shopper. She almost got a black belt in shopping. She, uh, she, she didn't fit, because of the children, she didn't quite finish that, but she's a very good shopper, and she, uh, you know, she's given me some great tips, too. So it, uh, I think you either have to use your spouse or you have to go out on your own. I, I had this biggest position my fun one time was Haynes, which owned legs, and uh, was a huge stock, and it was bought eventually by uh, Consolidated Foods, and it was a, the best division of Consolidated Foods. But it's my biggest position, and they had a monopoly on this legs. And legs is a really big hit. And I knew somebody would come along with a new product. And, uh, the, uh, and it was. Kaiser Roth introduced no nonsense. And I was worried that this thing was better, and I couldn't quite figure out what was going on. So I went to the supermarket, and I bought 62 pairs of no nonsense, different colors, different shapes. Different, they must have wondered what kind of house I had at home when I was going, <laughs> I was going back. But, 
I brought it in, I brought it to the office, and I passed it out to anybody, male or female, anybody wanted these things, just take them home and tell me how it is. And they came back in about three weeks and they said, it's not as good. And that's what research is. That's all it was, and I held on to uh, Haynes, and the stock was a huge stock. So that's what it's about. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lynch, and thank you all for being with us. All right. I apologize. Oh, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.